time tonight. We'll pick that up next week. Well, actually, we'll pick that up in two weeks. Next week is teen night, and we have a whole Wednesday night service uh, planned where our teenagers will do all the singing and all the preaching, and they'll do the ushering, and uh, they'll, they'll have the whole thing as they get ready to go to the fine arts competition, and that's always a fun night. I was listening to a couple of those groups sing today, and they sound incredible, and so praise the Lord for that. I'm excited in three weeks starting a new series on abandonment abandonment fixes nothing and you've heard me say that over and over and over and we're going to start a series on this abandonment in relationships abandonment in uh, uh, in righteousness abandonment and, and all these different things they all start with the letter R and when you look at abandonment in the Bible now we want you to abandon sin but this idea of abandoning well I'm going to leave my church because there's just, no, hold on, abandonment fixes nothing. And I'm excited for in three weeks we'll start that. Abandonment really helped Lot when he left Abraham, didn't it? Amen. Abandonment really helped Peter out when he denied Christ and left, did it, did it not? You look through the, it really helped Samson out when he left his uh, parents and just decided to do his own thing. Abandonment really worked out well, didn't it? And yet we always, we always think that abandonment's going to fix the problem. And really abandonment simply prolongs the problem. And so I'm excited for that series coming up in the next several weeks. And I'm excited to hear Brother Kretzman tonight. Brother Kretzman, you come. I mean it, man. We, we love preaching. And so you rear back and have yourself a time. And that video was very impressive. And I enjoy hearing missionaries' hearts. And Brother Scott, we talk a lot about missions. And our church has a heart for missions. And so we're excited to hear you. Would you give him a hand as he comes to preach tonight, please? Amen. Wow, now I'm nervous. <laughs> um, thank you so much. You've been very gracious. I've um, been looking forward to this meeting for quite some time, and we've enjoyed ourselves thoroughly already. We love going to places where Grandpa's name is known. Uh, it's amazing how many friends he has out there. <laughs> and so he told me, I told him I was going to be here, and he said, oh, make sure you tell everybody I said hello. It's been a while since I've been there, and I need to say hi to everybody. So Grandpa says hi, <laughs> and Granny says hi, and uh, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter number 9. <laughs> Um, I would encourage you to go to the back display table and um, get, get uh, some of the stuff we have available there to you. Um, not my laptop, but uh, go back there and get, uh, we have our prayer card. Um, it's not as big as your traditional one. Number one, we couldn't afford it. Uh, number two, it's probably too big anyway. So we have these small ones. Uh, you can take that. For those of you who are tech junkies and on the social media sites, you can uh, contact us that way. I would encourage you to do that. Um, those of you who have um, these little doobahickeys on your keychain, we now have one. So we want to dominate the real estate on your keychains. <laughs> so go to the back bowl there, um, and we have our prayer cards now by key tag, and, and our, our catchphrase, if you will, is take, take one of our key tags and turn your normal keychain into a prayer chain. Okay? So take that. I fully believe in using every media outlet we possibly can to keep missions in front of people. Uh, if the world's using it, why can't we put something good out on there? You know, uh, if there's so much junk out there on the internet. Hey, why not use something for good? Uh, so we fully believe that. Do that if you can, please. If you notice on the back, you can actually now start receiving our prayer letters on your cell phone. If you text the word Cuba to 313131, uh, you'll start getting our updates on your phone. So I would encourage you to do that as well. Uh, we've been traveling since uh, September 2010 full time. We're now 74% of the way there. Uh, and praise the Lord, I'm excited about that. We will finish this year and the next year we will be in language school. Uh, and then after that, we will move to the Dominican Republic. I want to explain just really briefly how our ministry works. I have to be so careful as to how much information I can put out there, given the nature of the country that we're going to, a communist country. Um, but just so everything is clear, we will live in the Dominican Republic because the country of Cuba is communist. Nobody can live there but Cubans. We will live in the Dominican Republic, and we can actually get the Cubans out of Cuba by way of an educational visa. Their government will approve them to leave the country, go to the Dominican Republic, and study in a Bible college so they can start churches all throughout Cuba. Isn't that amazing? It just took a little bit of research, a little bit of work, and a lot of prayer, and God led us to this point. And so uh, really pray with, with us about that. It's a huge ministry opportunity. And so we'll live in the Dominican, train them there at the Bible Institute that's already set up. We will then send them back as a Canadian. I will go back with them and assist them in planting churches all throughout the country. If you read the news, it's only a matter of time. 
uh, till those brothers get dead, really, um, and a new government comes in into play in Cuba. It's only a matter of time. And so I believe now we're going to lay the foundation for those years ahead. Uh, you history buffs, you'll, you'll remember General MacArthur when uh, Japan, the empire, fell. He said, we need to get missionaries in here because it's the custom of that country to worship the God of the, the nation that defeated them. So we need to get missionaries in here. And it's the same thing in Cuba. We need to reach people for the Lord. And so uh, do whatever you can, whatever God would have you to do. That's all that we want to encourage you to do. Uh, John chapter number 9, you should be there by now. Let's begin reading at verse number 1. It says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. I'd like to preach a message tonight that I've entitled, The Night Cometh. The Night Cometh. Uh, let's begin by going to God's throne. Father, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Uh, Lord, thank you for your love, wherewith you loved us. God, thank you for Jesus. Lord, how he provided a way for us to have eternal life. Lord, to live forever with him. God, thank you so much for the crowd that's here tonight on a Wednesday night. Uh, Lord, help them to be encouraged th th this night. Lord, would they be uplifted and, and yet challenged about what they're doing specifically to tell somebody else about Jesus. Lord, help us always to be working on somebody with the gospel. I pray that you would speak through me and that you would do something I cannot do and that's speak to hearts. Lord, I need you now and, and I pray that everything that's said and done will be for your honor and your glory. And Lord, thank you for all that you've done and all that you will do and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> in a recent article from the Christian News, I get them occasionally in my email, uh, there was some startling research that was compiled. It begins by saying, in a world of political correctness devoid of the rule of law, tolerance has come to mean total rejection of Christianity and moral standards. Modern tolerance redefines words like marriage, discrimination, equality, morality, and even absolutes. The word tolerance as it is used today never includes opposing arguments or competing worldviews. Does that sound very familiar? We're reaching a point in our world where, really, that's just what it is. You try to witness to somebody, give them the gospel, and they'll say, well, who are you to tell me that your way is right and mine isn't? We now reach you know, a point in our world where there are over a billion Muslims in our world, and, 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 and the rest of the world would point the finger at us and say, who are you to say that they're not right? Or who are you to say that you've got the only way, that Jesus is the only way? And they'll say something like this, you need to be a little bit more tolerant. And that's not at all what it is. <laughs> tolerance. A few examples of recent intolerance for Christianity in America. The Supreme Court determining to exclude anyone who prays in Jesus' name from a rotation of officials who open city business meetings. The removal of U.S. military chaplain Gordon Klingenschmidt over the issue of praying in Jesus' name. UCLA is prohibiting a graduating student from thanking her Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in her graduation speech. You catch a common theme here? Isn't it interesting that whatever they do, they always try to stamp out the name of Jesus? You know why? Because that's the name that is above all names. That's the name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the name of power. Colleges are making special accommodations for foot baths and Muslim-only prayer rooms. While a Muslim group membership may be suspended or revoked for 57 reasons, but they deny Christian groups campus recognition because it requires its officers and voting members to agree with its Christian beliefs. Well, you can have a Muslim-only prayer room and a Muslim foot bath in a college in America, but you better not think about starting a Christian group here. The night cometh when no man can work. 
A San Diego elementary school created an extra recess period to allow 100 Muslim students to pray, while a federal judge upheld the Knoxville, Kentucky jury's decision that a public school could prohibit its fifth grade Christian students from studying and discussing their Bibles at recess. The night cometh when no man can work. And I'm going to read one more to you. The Council on American Islamic Relations in Los Angeles requested an investigation of the desecration of a Koran as a hate crime. Conversely, when Palestinians tore up Bibles for toilet paper May 15, 2002, the Washington Times, there was no outrage. And after a church in the U.S. saved and held fundraisers to afford the cost of buying and shipping requested Bibles by an American sergeant in Afghanistan, those Bibles were confiscated, thrown away, and burned. The only official comment about the burning of the Bibles was this one by a Defense Department spokesman, and I quote, troops in war zones are required to burn their trash. Folks, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that there was somebody Years and years ago, during the First World War and the Second World War, where there was somebody that was saying, I'm willing to forsake home, I'm willing to forsake family, I'm willing to leave my job, my future, everything behind so that my children won't have to go through something that I don't want to go through. As important as that was, we need to understand that there's a battle going on around us, there's a war at hand, there's our children's futures at stake. If we don't decide that we've got to get on the front lines and tell somebody about Jesus, we don't know what we're going to be faced with in a few years. Amen. We don't know. Amen. The night cometh when no man can work. If you're considering serving God, can I encourage you to get off the fence Amen. and decide just to do it? Because we're not guaranteed another day. A few years ago in the news, it was reported of this man uh, who was found in the hills of Kentucky, in Tennessee, and investigators found $15 million of illegal goods strapped to his body. And so they surmised from the plane crash and all that that he had hijacked this plane and he had flown it illegally and was trying to, to bail out and, and have all of the, the, this wealth uh, for the rest of his life. And he jumped out with a parachute on his back and he pulled the cord and, you know, like Wile E. Coyote. <laughs> it never came out and he fell to his death. What he thought was a sure guarantee that he was going to be sitting pretty for the rest of his life was nothing but a lie. Can I encourage you today that there are people, Christians all over this world, that are strapping the world's goods to their bodies and bailing out on the Christian life thinking that it's for the better. But it's not. It's nothing but the lie of the devil. Folks, we have not come to a time where we need to bail out on God, but now's the time to say, I'm going to stand for what's right. I'm going to stand for what's true. I'm going to stand on the Word of God. And no matter what the obstacles in front of me, no matter what the culture prevailing around me, I'm going to do what's right. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what God's called me to do. We need to get back to old-fashioned Christianity. I can't stand this nonsense, and this is just another pet peeve, but, you know, going to a restaurant, those of you that have kids, and your child's disobeying, and you know you need to take care of it, but you know you can't. <laughs> I don't know if I get in trouble for saying that around here, but whatever. I just hate this politically correct society that we found ourselves in. God rid us of those, uh, the, the type of notion that we have to tiptoe around the, you know, the daisies and say everything's so perfect and, and be so right in every political, you know, argument there is. But when we just raise our Bibles and look at people and say, thus saith the Lord, this is what it says. Don't shoot me, I'm just the messenger. God said it, not me. We've got to present the facts. And I love reading my uh, missionary biographies. John Patton, uh, most of the time they encourage me because most missionaries in that day died en route to their country. Uh, although we've almost reached that point a couple times. <laughs> We're still alive, amen. <laughs> but they encourage me, all these missionary biographies. And John Patton is one of my favorites. Uh, he was going to the New Hebrides Islands in the South Pacific, uh, what is now called Vanuatu. And 20 years prior to Patton getting there, Two families were eaten alive by cannibals. Now, that's pretty nasty. I mean, that's almost as bad as drinking Dunkin' Donuts coffee. That's pretty gross right there. 
Everybody who knows anything about coffee knows Tim Hortons is where it's at. Anybody know what Tim Hortons is? Amen. God bless you. <laughs> and I'm not talking about Starbucks either. Forget that. <laughs> Everybody doesn't like me now, right? <laughs> Amen. But two families were eaten alive by cannibals. And so his family and church members and everybody was coming to John Patton and saying, John, what are you doing? You're not supposed to go to the place where they're eating people. And he would just brush it off. And there was one man, Mr. Dixon, who would come to John Patton and say, the cannibals, you'll be eaten by cannibals. And he always uh, tried to discourage him with that. And John Patton's reply to Mr. Dixon was this one. Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave. That's a nice way of saying you're getting old and you're going to die. Your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I submit to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me if my body is eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in that great resurrection day, my body will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. That was his answer. You know what he said? Well, I guess you better, you might as well go. <laughs> but really, that's what it all boils down to, is someday your body will be eaten by something, or, or Jesus Christ will come and take us home. We ought not to live our lives as Christians saying, I'll serve God when, or I'll serve God if, and leave a blank, because there's no end to that. But we've got to say, I will serve God now. Amen. I'll serve God. Amen. And John Patton was one of those men. It's interesting to read the rest of the story. He almost had the whole island turn to Christ by the time he died. He wrote their Bible in a few languages of their own. It wasn't without difficulty, but he knew the night will come when I'm not even going to be able to work. I've got to do the most I can now. I'd like us to look at three things tonight in light of working while it is day. The night cometh. The first thing is the sight of the Savior. The sight of the Savior. Look at it in verse number one. It says, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man. I believe right there hinges the rest of the passage. Do you know that if Jesus never saw him, he wouldn't have been able to help him? Amen. That's deep. I went to college. Amen. <laughs> If he never saw him, he couldn't have helped him. But yet, I think many of us can, can relate to that. And, and seeing people is half the battle. And I'm not talking about seeing them physically, but seeing them through the eyes of Christ, seeing them as somebody who is lost and on their way to hell, somebody who we ought to have a vision for. And Jesus saw this man for who he really was. Turn over to uh, Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. Every missionary knows this passage. Matthew chapter 9, verse number 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Go! Nope. Give! Nope. Pray, ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The greatest need we have for missions is for more laborers. Do you know that for every 10 missionaries that leave the field, two go back to replace them? The scene of a young man taking his young family to a foreign nation used to be something that happened all the time in grandfather, grandpa's generation and, and so on. That happened all the time. But we've got to understand that if we're not going to go ourselves, then we need to be the ones praying, say, God, would you send somebody to Cuba? God, would you send somebody to Africa? God, would you send somebody to the Middle East to reach the Muslims? Lord, I don't feel the call to go, but would you, would you please send somebody? Pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send the laborers. 
1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Do you understand that God looked on us, he saw us before we were even born, and he said, those are the people that I want to die for. They're the ones that I love, knowing everything about us. It's a sobering thought. The more you know your wife and your wife knows you, and the more things you find out each about each other that you don't like. Now, that's not true about me. My wife is perfect. Yeah. Amen. I love you, honey. No, yeah. <laughs> she drinks Dunkin' Donuts. That's the only blind spot on her. You know, okay, I'm just kidding. You know, but the more you find out about each other, the more you love each other. In spite of your, your blemishes and your faults and your drawbacks, but you grow closer together and you love each other more because of them and you try to help each other and encourage one another. Why? Because you look at your wife a certain way and you look at your husband a certain way. That point that pastor made about abandonment, that's true, it doesn't solve anything. So why would we, why would we apply that same principle to missions? Forgetting about a country that's 100% Muslim isn't going to change anything. We've got to think about that. We've got to pray about it. We've got to say, God, would you send somebody? I see them as the, through the eyes of, of the Savior. They're people that are lost. They're lost and on their way to hell. The sight of the Savior. But you know what happens is we come to service after service, and we've kind of trained ourselves to say, I don't want to make an emotional decision. You know, watching some game shows and they'll, uh, what is it, The Price is Right, and you watch the showcase showdowns and the person's bidding $80,000 on, you know, like a Toyota Yaris and a 4x4. They get so excited and they just can't think and they just, $100 million! You know, and they don't, they make an emotional decision. But we trained ourselves to come to church and say, I don't want to make an emotional decision. I can't let my emotions get involved in this. Meanwhile, people are dying and going to hell. I want to be careful about how much money I put in the offering plate. I want to be careful about how much time I spend reading my Bible or telling other people about Jesus Christ or how much time I go to church. Talk to your coworkers. You go to church how many times? Three? And then on Friday? And maybe like on an off day? They think you're crazy. But that's okay because it's something that's real. It's, it, it, it appeals to our emotions because this is the eternal state of a soul. It, it matters for our whole eternity. We ought to invest more time in, the, in God and His Word and reaching people than we should anything else. Yes, amen. We ought to. 1 John 3, 17, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? You see your brother have need, and you know you can do something about that, and I can... You know, Jesus said we're to love our neighbor, and the man said, well, who's our neighbor? And he said, well, everybody's your neighbor, really. Love your enemy, love everybody. And here we see somebody who has a need, and we know we can meet that need, and we, oh, man, I should just take a step back and budget, plan, make sure, talk to my pastor. And you ought to. But you don't need to talk to your pastor about leading somebody to Christ. We don't need to talk to our pastor about passing out a track. You don't need to talk to your pastor about doing what God says we need to do. Get out there and do it. We've got to do it. We've got to get out there. Get emotional. It's okay. In Matthew chapter 9, when the Bible says that Jesus was moved with compassion, that, those words moved with compassion literally mean it carries about the same emphasis as a cardiac arrest. Jesus saw the multitudes, the, the hundreds, maybe thousands of people, and see, there's no shepherd, there's nobody caring for their souls. He didn't take a step back and think about how much he should give to faith promise. <laughs> think about how much time he should take off work to serve in the church. He almost had a heart attack. He said, who's reaching those people? Is there anybody, is anybody out there reaching those people? Can I do something to help those people? He was beside himself, emotional. The sight of the Savior. My question is, do you see him tonight? Do you see the over 300 million people in Indonesia? 98% Muslim. Do you see the over billion people in India? 
Most of them Hindu or some other religion that's leading them down a path of destruction. They don't get to nirvana, folks. They end up in hell. Do you see the people through the eyes of Christ? Do you see your neighbor? Do you see your aunt, your uncle, your father, your brother? Do you see him? The sight of the Savior. Number two, the misunderstanding of the men. The misunderstanding of the men. Look at it, verse number two. It says, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither had this man sin or his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. This miracle took place in Jerusalem, near the pool of Siloam. And uh, in verses 1 and 2, the disciples asked this question because it reflected rabbinic theology. Okay, here's the, here's the steak, okay? <laughs> Chew on this. Reflected rabbinic theology. You know what had happened around that time is the rabbis had wrongly concocted the general principle that human sickness is a direct result of rebellion against God to a rigid system that attributed each and every sickness to specific sins. So let me illustrate it. It's not as though they were seeing somebody who was crippled and saying, oh, they're that way because they sinned. They were saying, oh, that man is crippled because he did this. Or that man was born with one leg because he did that. And they got it really down to a science where they could put in someone in their equation and the quadratic formula and it would come out just perfect every time. They knew exactly what they could categorize everybody into. And so the disciples get caught up into this and they ask Jesus, now, Lord, who sinned? Was it he or his parents? Because we've narrowed that down to just those, those two aspects right there. It's either him or his parents. Who's at fault here? Who can we blame? Who can we point the finger to? And Jesus, looking at this whole thing, is just shaking his head. What are you talking about? Who did sin here? His parents? He says, no, 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 that's not what it's about. Uh, look back in our verse. It says, uh, Jesus said, neither had this man sin or his parents. It's not about that. He says, but the, the works of God should be made manifest in him. The misunderstanding of the man. They misunderstood that when you see somebody who's broken, who's lost, who's a sinner, we're not to point the finger and say, who's at fault for your life? Did you do it or is your parents? Somebody walks in the church, they've got tattoos or they smell like cigarette and you say, ah, you're, you can just write you off from the plan of God. I know you did everything to deserve what you got. Oh, when we take a step back and say, it's not about that. Right. Amen. It's, can the works of God be made manifest yeah. in his life? Is this man even saved? That's the question we need to ask. Don't go around town like the Pharisees and say, oh, mm, they don't fit into my cookie cutter and they don't do this and they look like that, they talk like that. Yeah, they're sinners. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> we ought to look at people like Jesus and say, I have the works of God be made manifest in them. The works of God. We would do well to remind ourselves that Christ's mission desire uh, and, uh, and kingdom were not of this world. You know, all the, the Jews, they're waiting for Jesus to come and overthrow the Romans and set up his kingdom. But it's not about this world. It's about, it's about heaven. It's about the eternity. We got to look through everything through the eyes of eternity, the misunderstanding of the men. Uh, we'll be working with Steve Sidler, Brother Steve Sidler. He's doing an excellent job in the Dominican Republic. And you know, when he got there, he decided that God called him to start a church in one of the poorest and most dangerous areas of the whole Dominican Republic. He said, no, every, all the pastors would call him and say, brother, you need to reconsider this. Brother, you can't build a church on orphans. They'd say to him, you can't build a church that way. He said, no, God's called me here for whatever reason. I'm going to stay put. Praise God for people like that. Just stay where you are <laughs> for a little bit of time and see what God will do. And so he had his church was full of just orphans and street children and and he would love on them they'd come through and he'd he, he everyone was his own little individual buddy and he would work on him he'd see them saved he'd disciple them they'd come through and you know what here where he is now 15 years later he just recently in february started on i believe his fourth or fifth church plant saw over 75 people saved in a service he's got an arsenal of young men that have graduated through the institute, through the school, and are now called of God to start churches and preach. Amen. Why? Because he said, I'm not going to misunderstand what God is doing. They're poor. They smell terrible. You know, probably don't, doesn't look like they have a whole lot of potential. 
but I'm going to stay put. If you're on a bus ministry, can I encourage you? Look at those children. Like they're the, you know, the D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody got saved in Sunday school. You look at them like they're the, you know, the Billy Sunday. And you know, look at them like they're the, you know, the Jonathan Goforth. These are the future generation of missionaries and pastors and, and Christian laymen and servants. We can't put them in categories and judge. That's not our point. That's not our place. One of the biggest things that convicted me and challenged me about missions was children. You never will forget those children that you go to in a foreign country. And if you've been there like that, you know what I'm talking about. You'll never forget those faces of kids that will come running up to you and give you a hug even though it's the first time you've only met them. You'll never forget the faces of kids that you've led to the Lord. You know, you'll never forget those faces. And yet, did you know that over 22,000 children die every day? That is one child dying every four seconds, 15 children dying every minute, a 2010 Haiti earthquake occurring almost every 10 days, a 2004 Asian tsunami occurring almost every 10 days, an Iraq-scale death toll every 18 to 43 days, just under 8.1 million children die every year, every year. The sad reality is many of them have never heard. Every time I watch that video and I see those words linger, not heard. What would you do if you never heard? Where would you be if somebody didn't take the time to tell you? Not heard. We were driving from Chicago to uh, Sacramento. Anybody ever make that crazy trip? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Last year, we... Uh, I think we put close to 80,000 miles in our van last year. It was a lot of driving. I did not fall asleep at the wheel. <laughs> we were driving from Chicago to Sacramento, and we got off at this one exit in Sparks, Nevada. And we got off at Sparks, Nevada, and there we see, I saw what has now become a, a familiar sight. You get off the highway, the expressway, and you see somebody holding a sign. And if you're like me, for a long time, I looked down at them and saw their shoes and said, well, you've got better shoes on than I do. Why should I give you money? And we're quick to judge. And I would just write them off automatically. And now ah, you need to, you're probably richer than I am, you know? And I would for, totally forget about the fact that these are human beings. They're people that end up somewhere in eternity. And so I pulled over and Johnny was holding a sign saying, trying to get to Cleveland. Now I'm a Canadian, eh? <laughs> I don't know a whole lot about American geography, but I know enough that he was probably talking about the Cleveland in Ohio. <laughs> and so I pulled up to the red light and I shouted out to Johnny and said, hey, what are, you what are you doing trying to get to Cleveland? How are you all the way out here? And Johnny told me that uh, he, his parents had left him uh, when he was two days old. His mom was uh, an alcoholic, his dad a drug abuser, and he, didn't, he never met his, old, his biological parents. They gave him up for adoption. And he said he had to come out to California to find himself. Is anybody else tired of hearing that one? I just wanted to find myself. What do you mean? You're right there. I found you. You know, I got to find myself. No. And so I told Johnny, I said, Johnny, you don't need to find yourself. You need to find Jesus. You need to find Christ. And I began to witness to Johnny right there at the red light. He said something very intelligent. He said, Matt, how about we go over there to the KFC so the officer doesn't pull you over? That's a great idea. Let's go. So we drove over to the KFC, and, and I walked in, and I, I said, Johnny, I'm going to buy you a meal. What do you want? Popcorn chicken. What? I'm going to buy you a meal, Johnny. Get whatever you want. A popcorn chicken. Okay. It's neither popcorn nor chicken. Come on. Amen. And so I opened my Bible, and you know that feeling when you open the Bible in a public place, and just that feeling of conviction and power and I love doing that. I opened the Bible in KFC, and I began to lead Johnny to Christ, and the whole time he couldn't stop crying. He couldn't stop crying. And he bowed his head and trusted Christ, and it was the sweetest time I ever had leading somebody to the Lord. He was just totally broken. Like, I could see, I could see Christ putting him back together like, like clay in the potter's hand. It was excellent. It was wonderful. But he said something to me that I'll never forget. After he prayed and trusted the Lord, he looked at me and he said, Matt, with tears streaming down his face, he said, Matt, if this story is so true, and it is, why didn't somebody tell me that when I was a kid? Ooh. 
Yeah. It's a great question. I have no idea. 22,000 children dying every day. You know when the majority of them will stand before God someday? They'll all stand before God, but many of them will stand before God and say something like, you mean I, don't have, I didn't have to go to hell? Why didn't somebody tell me? Why didn't somebody tell me? What's our answer going to be? I don't know. The sight of the Savior. Do you see them tonight? The misunderstanding of the men. Don't forget, it's not about where they've been, but it's where they're going. That's the important thing. Number three, the charge of the changed. Verse number six, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. I won't belabor this last point, but I find it interesting to note that the Bible calls that pool the pool of Siloam, and then it defines it for us. It says the pool that is called sent. Is it any coincidence that this man is blind? He can't see. His whole perspective on life is, is one that is not eternal, that is not spiritual, is not interested in God or, or spiritual matters. But when he gets to that pool and he washes and his, his eyes receive sight, and he has a new lease on life. He sees things totally different than what he ever saw before. That that pool is the pool that is called sent. What was Jesus saying? If you've been saved, if there have been a time in your life where you were once headed down that path, you were going the wrong way, you had a totally different perspective on life, and Jesus saved your soul. He washed you in the blood of Christ. You know the pool that you were washed in? is the pool that is sent. You are now sent into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature. Does geography make any difference at all? No. I'm doing what you are doing, but just in a different country. I'm telling somebody about Jesus. That's all I'm doing. We're all missionaries. You know, teenagers, they, I love explaining it to them this way. And some of you older folks might get a chuckle out of this. Remember the time where you were younger and your mom says, son or daughter, I would like you to take out the trash. And your answer to your mom is something like this. Well, mom, it's a reasonable command, but I just don't think I'm called to take out the trash. <laughs> mom, I'm sorry, I'm not called. What would your mom do? <laughs> Whack! <laughs> Some of you might still have the shoe print to prove it, huh? <laughs> but can we make it that simple? Can we bring it down to that level? Jesus commanded his disciples in the church, and thereby all of us, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. God, I'm not called. Uh, excuse me? That's right. You're called. You're commanded. We don't need to wait for this mysterious tap on the shoulder or this pat on the back, but we need to always have our ears sensitive and our eyes looking for people that we can witness to, that we can give the gospel to. Pray for those people. And if you can't reach them, pray that somebody will go and tell them about them. The charge of the changed. I want to read one last thing to you. It was by a very famous man. Not called, did you say? Not heard the call. I think you should say. Put your ear down to the Bible and hear him bid you go and pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Put your ear down to the burdened, agonized heart of humanity and listen to its pitiful wail for help. Go stand by the gates of hell and hear the damned entreat you to go to their father's house and bid their brothers and sisters and servants and masters not to come there. And then look Christ in the face whose mercy you have professed to obey and tell him whether or not you will join him heart and soul and body and circumstance in the march to publish his mercy to the whole world. I think it would drastically change our lives if we would hear like that rich man did and Lazarus. He went down to hell and he begged, please send somebody to tell my brothers Please send somebody. What do he say? If you'll just send the Moses or the prophets. And God said, verily I say unto you, if one come, that if one raised from the dead, 
he will not believe. What happened? One did raise from the dead, Christ. And yet how many still reject him? But if we would hear the call of those people that are in hell today, they would beg and plead and implore and do everything they can to convince you to go and tell those people that we look at and say, and hear them say, I'm an atheist, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Muslim, I don't believe in God. And their, their relatives burning in hell would say, please tell them. Don't listen to it. It's a lie. Just tell them, please. Don't give up on them. The sight of the Savior, the misunderstanding of the men. God can use anybody. The charge of the changed. Would to God there be some people tonight that would understand that the night will come when we won't even be able to work anymore. But would you purpose in your heart this week to do whatever you can to tell somebody else about Jesus and encourage your pastor along the way. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you so much for this church, for its vision. Lord, immediately when I walked in here, I could tell that this was a church that was concerned with missions and with souls. Lord, their annual theme this year is souls. God, help every member to catch a vision of that, to get involved, to find their place, to plug themselves in the organism that is the church. And Lord, I pray that you would receive all the honor and glory for it. Thank you so much for saving my soul. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Maybe you're here tonight. You say, Pastor, I don't even know for sure that I'd go to heaven. If I died tonight, I don't even know that I'd go to heaven. Would you slip your hand up? I'm the only one looking. Let me pray for you. You say, Pastor, if I died this evening, I'm not sure that I'd go. I see your hand right here. God bless you, ma'am. Is there anybody else? Pastor, please pray for me. I just don't know, but I'd like to. I see your hand right over here. Thank you. Is there anybody else? You'd raise your hand. I'm looking right over here. God bless you. Is there anybody else? I see this hand here. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else tonight to join these four? Anybody? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you just raised your hand, would you look right here at me? These ladies right over here, Mrs. Hall, if you'd make your way back, and Brother Troy, you'll point out right here, just get all the way to the back there. Sarah, if you'd stand and make your way halfway to the back. Ma'am, would you wave? This is my wife coming your direction. There you go. I'm looking right over here. Mrs. Robinson, would you stand to your feet, make your way around? Young lady right there, would you just wave at Mrs. Robinson so she knows where she's coming? Right there. Somebody pointed at somebody else right over here. Brother Robinson, I'll let you confirm and uh, take care of that there. Thank you. That was a fantastic message by a man of God. And I don't know how God worked in your heart. I know how he's worked in mine. But maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I just need to come do business with God. The altar's open. Father, I pray that you'd bless this invitation. These that hear about Christ, may they understand it's not a Baptist way to heaven, but a Bible way to heaven. And I pray that they'd put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Do a work in our heart. May we be moved with compassion like our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand together, nobody's looking. Let's use the altar tonight. God's doing something in your heart. I know he is. Why don't you come down and talk to him about it?
107 there in your hymnal as folks continue to pray and others are being dealt with for salvation. Would you sing it with me? So little time, the harvest will be over. Sing 107. So little time, the take a love offering tonight and so if you would reach into your pocket or your wallet or your purse let's put something in for this dear family as we show them in just a financial way how much we love them and then in a few minutes we'll vote unanimously I think to take them on for support and so we're excited for that on that last verse would you sing please the harvest wine with reapers few is wasting that you'd bless this offering and that we would give generously to this family called of God to a nation where we won't go or we haven't called us to but Lord we'll give and we'll pray and we'll support we love you so much in Jesus name amen you may be seated Jessica Mason right over here raised her hand tonight and just accepted Christ as her Savior. Would you give her a hand as she talks to my wife? And then over here, we had this young lady come tonight. Tierra RCC came and trusted Christ as her Savior tonight. She's down front with Mrs. Robinson. Our church has always had a heart for missions, even before I came to Calvary Baptist Church, and that's never been a secret, and I'm sure proud of you for having that heart. I'd like to remind you that we do uh, faith promise, and so if you ever get to the point where you just say, well, I just can't afford to give to missions, you committed by faith. 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for. You ever hope or wish you had more? Yeah, faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That describes some of your checking accounts right there? Yeah. And we do it by faith promise, and we support missionaries all around our world. In the next year and a half, we'll be starting the Calvary's Love Children's Home uh, there in Africa, and we're excited for those things. And as missionaries come through, we try and screen them properly, and we make sure, and I can guarantee you as pastor, that he's doctrinally sound, and uh, his wife is definitely the better half, just getting to know him a little bit. So I'm just kidding. We're sure glad to meet both of you. And I'd like to present them to the church at this time. All in favor of accepting them into our mission, onto our missions team, signify by saying a hearty amen. amen. If there's any opposed by like sign, praise the Lord. Look at all these men standing in the back for anybody who would have said no. No, I'm just kidding. That's not why they're back there. Thank you, ushers. Welcome, Kretzmans. Give them a hand if you would. As you two stand, would you make your way back to your missions display? Calvary Baptist Church takes you on, starting uh, with a love offering tonight, but starting next month for $100 a month, and you stay faithful, and we will, and we're sure happy that you came here. Let's stand together, church. Make sure you go by, greet them, shake their hands. If you, for some reason, did not give to the love offering, but you'd like to slip cash in their hand, feel free to do so. They have two beautiful children that will be uh, brought into the auditorium in the next few minutes. Folks, I love you so much much and thank you for being here tonight a great crowd on a Wednesday night tomorrow night 6 30 right here soul winning visitation RUI on Friday night Saturday morning 10 o'clock bus rally and soul winning I love you have a great night you are dismissed choir